Exactly. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for coming. Uh, welcome to the Programs uh, in Public Law session with Patrick Guerrero. He's the president of uh, the Log Cam Republicans, a national organization for uh, gay and lesbian conservatives. And um, first of all, I want to thank our sponsors. In addition to uh, Programs in Public Law, Professor Schroeder, we also, um, this is co-sponsored by um, Duke Out actually was the main sponsor in bringing um, Patrick to campus, and then but this event today is co-sponsored by the the Duke Law Republicans, Duke Law Democrats, and Outlaw. So I think it's a good good mix of uh, of folks uh, here and uh, interested in this topic. Um, I'm actually going to defer uh, to James for the for the introduction to Patrick, but I, I do want to mention that there also is an event tonight at 7 p.m. at the Richard White Auditorium on East Campus, um, and there uh, at that session it will be a different format. This is going to be more of a uh, just a brief presentation, and then uh, he'll open it up to questions. Tonight's uh, presentation will be more about um, Patrick's personal journey. Um, he'll be showing a portion of a video, I believe, and um, so it's a more formal presentation. This is this is the informal part. We just roped him into this one. So, uh, without further ado, here's James. Thank you. It's uh, certainly an honor and a privilege to be introducing uh, Patrick Guerrero today. And for the people on the front row, if you could save me a slice of pepperoni pizza, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> There is a lot that this man has accomplished, and I read his bio uh, earlier today, and I read it yesterday, and the list goes on and on of his life's accomplishments. So I'll just share a few of those accomplishments with you. Patrick Guerrero has de devoted his career to public service. This former mayor, state representative, and candidate for lieutenant governor of Mass Massachusetts joined Log Cabin Republicans as executive director in January 2003. Guerrero, who grew up in a working class family, has earned a reputation as a dedicated, effective, and compassionate public servant. Guerrero is a leading voice for freedom and fairness in the Republican Party. He has appeared on all the major television networks on programs such as Hardball with Chris Matthews, and if you can uh, deal with Chris Matthews, you've, you've done well. <laughs> the O'Reilly Factor, and uh, again, if you can deal with Bill O'Reilly, he's done well too. Nightline and Inside Politics. Plus, he has been featured in many publications, including the Washington Post, the New York Times Magazine, and the Los Angeles Times. Guerrero has written op-eds for the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, and other newspapers. Guerrero is a skilled candidate who has never lost an election. He won three terms for state representative and two terms for mayor of, Re of Melro Melrose, Massachusetts, his hometown. A little bit about his personal life is that Guerrero is a young man. He's 36 years old. He is the son of, what's that, 37? No, so I'm getting older. Getting older? <laughs> 36 is the son of an Italian immigrant and Mason Pasquale and a social worker, Sandra. He enjoys a close relationship with his parents, his two sisters, his nieces, and his grandfather, who is an Albanian immigrant. Guerrero learned hard work, leadership, and values from his working class family. He worked his way through college, including summers spent mixing cement and hauling bricks for the family masonry business. He played soccer and served as a student body president before graduating summa cum laude from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. in 1990. The next year, Guerrero attended Boston College's Thomas P. O'Neill Jr. Fellowship in American Government Program. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and my privilege to introduce to you with Teresa today, Mr. Patrick Guerrero. Thanks. Thank you, James, for that embarrassing introduction. Um, it's really nice to be in your company. I'm glad I'll be able to join you again uh, this evening on campus. Um, I send my condolences after the basketball game last night. Um, uh, I want to uh, tell you a few things. One thing about log cabin Republicans. Uh, I was not a log cabin Republican up until two years ago when I took over this job. Uh, because when I was asked, I said, you know, what, what actually is a log cabin Republican, and is there such thing as a uh, credible gay conservative? And I found out a lot as a part of that discussion and that process that was uh, 
and I've learned a lot over the last two years in this position. One note of history about the Log Cabin Republicans. They were founded just over 27 years ago. They were founded when a legislator in California, uh, right around 1977, 78, decided to offer a ballot uh, initiative, they do that often in California, um, that would ban gay and lesbian citizens in California from teaching in the public schools, which is a you know, remarkably offensive initiative, but actually was winning in the polls by about 20 or 30 percent. There was a group of conservatives at that point, men and women, who happened to be uh, gay and lesbian, who had worked within Republican circles, and they just were so offended by this and, and, and believed this thing might pass. So they gathered together in homes, and they tried to figure out what they could do about it. And what they decided to do was to reach out to a man um, by the name of Ronald Reagan, who had just been their governor, who was considering running for president. And they had a private meeting with former Governor Reagan at the time, and asked him if he would consider making a statement about this initiative. They felt it was their moral and ethical and political obligation to do so as gay and lesbian Americans in California. And remarkably, after the meeting with Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan came out uh, within the next couple of days and said that the ballot initiative was, was un not come out. <laughs> you know, that would be a great news story. Um, <laughs> although Abraham Lincoln apparently came out this week in several newspapers. The, um, that uh, Ronald Reagan uh, publicly denounced the ballot initiative. And very few people knew at the time that it was this group of very focused gay and lesbian conservatives that were willing to take that uh, risk to sit down with Ronald Reagan, to get a conservative, a Republican, to come out against the ballot question. As a result of Ronald Reagan's public denouncement of that uh, piece of legislation, instead of passing weeks later by 20 percentage points, the ballot question lost. And what we know is that when initiatives like that come up in California, they often spread to the rest of the nation. And so this very small group of gay and lesbian Americans who were probably at that point closeted but very conservative and active in Republican politics in their own small way were able to change a moment in history that impact, could have impacted gay and lesbian teachers and families for a really long time. And that's where Log Cabin Republicans were founded uh, nearly uh, 30 years ago. And we've grown since, arrived in Washington uh, about 12 years ago. I have been uh, embarking on a nationwide tour, um, which I talk a little bit about tonight. I've now reached 40 states and 130 cities in 18 months. So I live in hotels and airports. When I started that journey, I never expected the country would uh, have, have experienced the type of cultural war and political, heated political debate that, that we have witnessed in the last year and a half. Some of it good, some of it tough, some of it controversial. Some of it um, allowing for gay and lesbian Americans to take steps forward in the fight for full equality and fairness, and other times a sense of real backlash that things are moving in the opposite direction. But it's been a neat thing to be able to travel the country and watch how so many parts of the country that never talked about these issues are finally having a discussion, a thoughtful one at times, at times very heated. There's very few kitchen tables in America that haven't in some form or other discussed what this all means. And I think ultimately when history looks back at these few years and the few years ahead, they'll see it as the moment the American family dealt with this and dealt with it I think ultimately well because I think the American people ultimately are fair-minded. I was uh, talking to someone about what I'll be talking about tonight in terms of my personal journey and I was talking to a reporter from this area and they, they referred to me as something like a contradiction in terms that had been walking through my bio. They said, you're a Republican from Massachusetts. That's quite fascinating. <laughs> um, you're a conservative from the Northeast. You're Catholic and you're gay. That's a whole other lecture at another time. <laughs> sociology department, we'll be dealing with that later. Um, I'm gay and a Republican, as you know. I'm gay and I have absolutely no fashion sense. I had to ask the hotel person if the tie matched the jacket and the shirt. Um, but I have found joy in my life, and I talk about it more extensively this evening, in finding a role for people who believe in institutions, whether it be my family or my political party or my church, um, 
having such belief in those institutions that I'm willing to stick it out within those institutions even if I have great difficulty with parts of them or the hierarchy or the leadership at a particular moment. I have found that there is value in some of us, not necessarily all of us, sticking it out in some of those institutions and making a difference and that while some may protest by leaving those institutions or fighting those institutions from the outside, that there is a role in American life whether it be religious or political or family, to stick it out, to do it with integrity, to be honest, and engage in a multisyllabic, thoughtful, heated debate as a way to move those institutions forward. And I know from the outside, and you know this, the person speaking to you is a little bit odd when the people sponsoring can be the Duke Law Democrats and Republicans and gay groups. It's a very interesting statement about how strange my life is. But that there, there is a unique, unique role for folks like me to play. And I think this, the unfortunate part over the last bunch of decades is too many people have abandoned imperfect institutions. And it's left them to not have to be forced to navigate through the tough, complex social issues that, that I care so much about. My personal journey, as I noted, has been a really blessed one. And when James was talking about um, the different things I've been able to experience in life, it's, it, I feel like I should be 125 years old. Uh, but probably the most important thing I did in my life is that in my 20s I decided that closets were for clothes and not for me. Uh, that I wanted to be honest with myself about my sexual orientation and I hoped, deeply hoped, that it would not impact my desire to run for public office or be involved in public policy. And I know that um, in the scope of American life that there's been very few gay and lesbian Americans who have been as privileged as I have to be elected to local office, to be elected mayor of my home city and in the legislature, to be able to run for lieutenant governor. There's not a lot of folks because history made it so uncomfortable and difficult for folks to be honest about their sexual orientation until uh, my generation that have been able to experience those joys and to do it with, with peace and have the support of family and to do it openly and to do it honestly. And so I feel uh, grateful for that. What I wasn't prepared for, for though, after 10 years of um, intense uh, public life and running for office six times in 10 years and <laughs> being able to uh, go to the grocery store and spend 35 minutes in the first aisle from people who were complaining about class size or the snow wasn't picked up after a snowstorm, was I thought I could step away from some of that for a few years and recharge my batteries by coming to Log Cabin and giving something back to the gay and lesbian community and helping the Republican Party work through these issues, I thought it would be kind of quiet and under the surface, wouldn't be a lot of fanfare, not a whole lot of drama. I was promised that during the interview process when I took the job and those individuals lied to me. Um, <laughs> it's been an amazing series of events that we have all witnessed in American political life and social life in the course of the last two years during my tenure. One of my very first days at the job uh, Rick Santorum, our senator from Pennsylvania, decided to share with all of us in America that he thought the uh, overturn of the sodomy laws in Texas would lead to a, a sharp spike in polygamy and bigamy and all sorts of things that he thinks about, apparently, uh, more often than most of us. Um, <laughs> and there I was as a Republican, leader of an organization that believes in fairness for gay and lesbian Americans, asked to respond to this statement by Senator Santorum. And I, interestingly enough, was offended partly because I'm a gay American, but also because I'm a conservative. The notion that a United States Senator, who in this case happened to be a Republican, would uh, believe that part of the American family doesn't have a fundamental right to privacy, that the government should be allowed to walk into the bedroom of uh, a citizen in the country, and because they're intimate or close with somebody who happens to be of the same sex that that person should be arrested is remarkably offensive for certain legal minds, for conservative minds, and for Republicans in my estimation. And so I had an interesting moment when I started this job which was to remain silent because I wanted to protect a fellow Republican or remain silent because by countering the statement by a Republican senator fourth in leadership in the Senate it might offend him or other people in the Republican Party. And I made a decision um, which was just a gut decision and I got the support from the folks that I work with to forcefully denounce this person 
for saying something that offended us on all of those levels. And it was a controversial thing to do for our organization, but it really started a gut check about what it means to be an organization that is both that believes in conservative principles and believes in the, the, the basic tenets of the Republican Party, um, but also needs to stand up in a prominent and aggressive and forceful way when there are folks within our party, even folks that I work with, and I work with Rick Santorum on a series of other issues around global aids and um, uh, tax policy and social security reform and other issues, how do you confront those things? And we made the decision to be forceful and do our part so that groups on, who are more progressive and left-leaning and more democratic didn't have to carry the whole weight of speaking out against that. And it's a good sample of the way I think there are moments when Democrats and Republicans, uh, regardless of sexual orientation, can actually work together to help move the, the ball forward. And I think that episode for Senator Santorum reminded folks there are a lot of people in America, some who may support gay marriage, some who don't, who are offended with certain issues like, and it support issues like a fundamental right to privacy and decency for all Americans. But you had Rick Santorum, then you had the Supreme Court passing, overturning the sodomy laws in a historic decision. And as a Republican, I would note that the author of that decision was Anthony Kennedy, an appointee of Ronald Reagan, and three out of the five justices who supported that decision were appointees of Republicans, not often written much about. Then I had my wonderful home state of Massachusetts decided to do a small thing, which is recognize the right of marriage equality for all citizens in the Massachusetts Constitution. And I should note again as a Republican that six out of the seven justices on the Massachusetts Supreme Court who wrote that decision were Republican appointees, appointed by Republicans Bill Weld, Paul Cellucci, Jane Swift. And I knew a lot of those justices in their background. I, I knew they would write a decision that might be controversial, but we all assumed it might be a civil union-like decision like Vermont's. But it obviously ended up being something uh, much more dramatic, much more powerful, um, and some people think successful and have changed the debate around the country and others thought, have thought that it was something that just moved this debate so fast that it led to an unnecessary backlash. But history, I think, will will tell. Then we had a mayor in San Francisco who one day woke up and decided he uh, wanted to marry people because he believed as mayor uh, in a place where they give marriage licenses, civil marriage licenses, that all of the citizens that he uh, represented deserve the right to, to marriage. Another decision, controversial, put a human face, as you saw, hundreds of gay and lesbian couples waiting to get married. A huge debate, uh, folks like Barney Frank and Myself and some others concerned about the sense that it may have been perceived as countering the rule of law, that maybe Massachusetts was a better place to experiment with it, but a, an amazing moment that was on the front page of every newspaper and led news stories and led to a really healthy debate within the American family and the gay and lesbian community about whether it was strategic and smart or not, but it certainly changed the, the, the framework of the debate. Then you had, within days of that, uh, the President of the United States on February 24th, standing in the uh, Rose Garden, announcing from the bully pulpit of the White House that he was going to support a constitutional amendment that would ban gay marriage. And unfortunately, from my perspective, not only ban gay marriage, but also in its second sentence would jeopardize civil unions and potentially even domestic partnership legislation. A tough day, as you might imagine, for a, the head of the log cabin Republicans. And as I talk a little bit about tonight, I have the responsibility as head of this organization to be probably the one person um, that actually asked the president not to support a constitutional amendment. You know, thanked him for his leadership on a series of issues, talked to him about the days after September 11th, and talked to him about um, the people who believe in liberty and freedom and equality for all Americans and asked him not to divide the American family by supporting an amendment. And so you can imagine kind of the kick to the gut it was for someone like me to watch the president do that from the White House and trying to figure out if he meant it, if he was going to really push this, whether he was doing it because of Karl Rove's advice or otherwise, but ultimately, obviously, being deeply disappointed in that, uh, that decision. Then you had a governor decide to come out with his wife standing next to him in New Jersey, announcing that he was a gay American. All the way down to this week, James Dobbin announced, announcing that uh, SpongeBob SquarePants is gay. Um, so we have gone from, you know, 
Supreme Court decisions, fundamental right to privacy, the first Supreme Court case that really speaks volumes to the fact that all Americans uh, need to be valued and respected, um, to constitutional amendments that would change the nation's founding documents, to governors coming out with their wife, to SpongeBob SquarePants. You could not uh, come up with more ingredients to create a bizarre set of circumstances that has led the country to almost force everybody in the country to deal with this in some way or the other. And what we have tried to do at uh, Log Cabin is to provide a place for the millions of gay and lesbian Americans and our straight allies and our friends to be able to work within the Republican Party because we are conservative on uh, foreign policy, we are conservative on crime and punishment, we are conservative when it comes to government reform and the size and scope of government. We think we have an important role to engage in a discussion with folks who make up part of the American family, namely the conservative side of the American family. And as you all know, which is the reality of America, is that Republicans uh, control nearly everything. The White House, both the Congress, the United States Senate, most governorships, most state legislatures, regardless of your party affiliation, regardless of your position on these complex social issues, the reality of America today is that uh, Republicans and red states and people of faith and people who believe in a more uh, value-based government happen to control much of our political dialogue. And you may determine that to be good or bad, but it is the reality. And one of the realities that I touch base, uh, talk about tonight as you all know, that if you want to pass any law in America, it takes 60 votes in the United States Senate. So if you're ever going to, if, you, if someone in this room believes in hate crimes legislation, or the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, or believes that every federal employee in the government should have domestic partnership or civil unions, there is simply no way in the American form of government to pass that legislation unless you and I and folks who believe in fairness for all Americans actually sit down and talk to conservatives about why the things that we want and need and want to share in are fundamentally conservative in nature. Or we will be in this classroom 50 years from now really, really old and be having the same exact debates with the same exact divide, with the same split, red and blue states, Republicans and Democrats in Congress. What we need to do is figure out a way that Republicans and conservatives understand that the fight for basic fairness is fundamentally American. And it's something that uh, I have talked much about. One of the things I'll note that uh, before closing is that in my uh, debates around the country, I have a pleasure of spending a lot of time with folks from the far right, debating them on television, seeing them in person, doing forums with them. It's really a terrific way to live your life. Um, whether it's Pat Buchanan or Robert Knight from is he from the Concerned Women's for America? I don't know how he got that title. But um, the, the reality is I share these moments with conservatives, sometimes in public, sometimes on TV, sometimes in, in these forums. And it's amazing to me. They always frame the discussion in pointing at me by saying, you know, Patrick, you, you, know, you're, you were a good Republican for years. You ran for public office. You were the, all the tax groups really respected you, you were really tough on crime as mayor, you, you know, got your city to be more disciplined and, and uh, really challenged and worked with teachers unions to enhance the quality of public education. Now you've become a radical homosexual activist. As some form of that is said by each of these. And so I often turn to people like Pat Buchanan or when I'm on Bill O'Reilly's uh, radio show or TV program and I say to them, you know, I, I'm with you on a lot of occasions, and I said, I find myself talking about three things, both in your company and as I travel all across the country. I find myself talking about three things. The first thing I talk about is stable relationships, that gay and lesbian Americans want to be able to share in um, stable, conservative, loving relationships that are respected publicly, that take on not only the rights that we don't have currently, but actually the responsibilities, the moral, ethical, and legal responsibilities that come with publicly recognized relationships. And yes, the country deserves a debate about marriage equality versus civil unions versus domestic partnership, but um, ultimately, gay and lesbian people wanting to have boring relationships is not radical at all. It's very conservative. 
we want to fight over who takes out the trash and who's pay, you know, spent too much on the credit cards. And there is nothing radical homosexual about wanting every American to have the freedom, the liberty, to choose their life partner and to engage in a relationship with public recognition that comes with the responsibilities of that relationship. And so I often turn and say, what is so radical about that? What is radical is that there are some folks on the very far right who somehow believe that by denying people the right to those relationships with those responsibilities, to me, that is radical. And so it's really Pat Buchanan who's radical. He hates when I say that. So stable relationships. The second thing I talk a whole lot about, and particularly in the last year, is the fact that our government today denies the right for gay and lesbian citizens, the most patriotic of them, who serve in our nation's armed forces to be honest and open about their sexual orientation. As we sit here today, um, and as we all know, yesterday was a tragic day for the country and having um, nearly 40 people die in both the helicopter crash and fighting the war on terrorism, that over in Fallujah and Baghdad and Afghanistan and all around the country, there are thousands of people, including some of my friends, maybe some of your family members, who are serving the nation, doing the highest duty of an American, and they happen to be gay or lesbian. Imagine what it's like for some of my friends and people I know when they are asked to fill out the form, uh, notification form, in the event that they are blown up in Fallujah. They have to lie about who should be notified. Imagine having to be dishonest to your government to the head of your um, troops to be unable to have your partner notified if you die in the line of duty or are injured seriously. Imagine the emotion that comes with that at a time that our nation's armed forces are fighting side by side with Australia's armed forces and the British armed forces, all who are integrated. We actually have American troops now under the command of openly gay commanders from other countries. It just doesn't make sense. And so I turn to Pat Buchanan or Gary Bauer or Tony Perkins, whoever I'm debating, and say, let me get this right. I'm a radical homosexual activist. Most of you have never served in the armed forces. And today, I have thought we have thousands and thousands of patriotic Americans who happen to be gay. And we think they should be able to notify, honestly, um, who should be informed if they are killed in the line of duty. There is nothing radical about that. In fact, I would argue that it's patriotic, it's American, it's the right thing to do. And so I talk about boring, stable relationships, serving in the military. And the last thing I talk a lot about is that gay and lesbian Americans are often um, people of faith. Um, that I travel the country a lot and I talk about, talk to people from all different faith backgrounds about how they deal with their own personal faith experience and how to deal with their sexual orientation in light of that. Some come from very welcoming and inclusive church communities. Others struggle with their synagogues or mosques. But each of them are struggling with that issue. And some gay and lesbian Americans actually want to be bishops in certain churches. And amazingly so, we are actually starting to see them. And there are people who are offended by all that. And I remind them that I have never heard uh, anywhere in my travels and having these discussions, any gay and lesbian activist or straight ally who has said that any church should be forced to accept anybody for any reasons. We believe in religious freedom, meaning people should be able to deny gay and lesbians to be a part of marriage ceremonies and whatever forever if they choose that within a church. I may dislike it, but I don't want to be a part of dictating anything when it comes to religion, obviously. But instead of the far right bashing people and bashing other churches who've chosen to take those important steps towards embracing part of their, their family, um, why would they want to deny us a chance to be spiritual people of faith and even take leadership roles within church communities that are accepting? And so a very odd thing happens when I'm debating these um, terrific people um, is that they end up pushing words like radical and homosexual and all this, and I end up simply talking about conservative relationships and patriotism and being good Americans and wanting to be a person of faith. And I guess the challenge, and I particularly relay this challenge to, to those in the room who might be more progressive and democratic-leaning, um, 
is to understand that I think the next phase of the civil rights movement for gay and lesbian Americans is for gay and lesbian Americans and our allies to be able to take on the lexicon of conservatives and talk about values and talk about family and talk about duty and country and responsibility so that we can break down that divide between blue and red states and break down the divide between Republicans and Democrats. And I think until we do that, we would still have this unnecessary divide that could, could last very, very long. And we should understand in doing that that you're never going to convince the Pat Buchanan's or Gary Bowers or James Dobson's of the world. That is not our target audience. Our target audience is a group of fair-minded Americans who are just trying to figure all of these issues out. And if I can do that in a way that's multisyllabic and thoughtful on occasion, um, I think in the end um, the American family will be stronger, the Republican Party will be able to grow up through these issues and realize that too many of its leaders in the last bunch of years have uh, made this an issue that uh, unfortunately has uh, divided the American family. And too many Democrats have uh, kind of winked during election years and then not delivered when they were in charge in Washington. Um, I remember being in Washington when Bill Clinton was in the White House, the first president to really speak out on gay and lesbian issues and did it forcefully and it really made a difference. Yet his legacy in the White House even with the Democratic-controlled Senate and Congress was inability to pass the Employment Non-Discrimination Act and inability to pass hate crimes. And he signed the Defense of Marriage Act and the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy. And so we need to turn up the heat, not only on people like President Clinton who spoke out uh, forcefully on these issues, and I spoke to him at the White House and thanked him for that. We have to turn up the heat and say it's unacceptable for even our friends to turn their backs on us for whatever reason, political or otherwise. And on the other side, good conservatives can't sit back quietly and put, um, you know, cover up and protect Republicans who unfortunately, particularly in election seasons, use code words that attempt to play on people's misunderstanding and fears. So there's great challenges ahead. The good news is that if four years ago we had sat in this, in this same room and said that there would be uh, in exit polls, there would be 66% of Americans support recognition for gay and lesbian families, either civil unions or civil marriage, that people would be married in one state, have civil unions in Vermont for four, that six other states were moving towards civil unions, um, that this, the Supreme Court would have had such a historic decision. We would have laughed at each other saying that's simply not going to be the case. This is an issue that's moving very fast, likely to be resolved within the next 10 years, and the challenge is whether we will do it in a way that is thoughtful and incremental and helps change this in a positive direction or whether we will just fight over this for a decade and end up unfortunately dividing not only the American family as a whole but actually dividing small families and dividing some of our own families. I don't think that needs to happen. Thanks for letting me be in your company. Can I take a few questions? Great. Um, yeah, you, so you talked about, um, you know, uh, the American family having to talk about this at the, at the kitchen table because of all these, all these series of events. Um, and um, how, how, do you, how, do you, how, do you, how do you respond to kind of, because um, one of the events you didn't mention was the actual election day in the 11 states that um, passed uh, some kind of anti-marriage um, amendment or statute or something. Yep. Um, how do you respond to say, you know, fair-minded Americans sat around the kitchen table, talked about it leading up to the election, and in 11 states with completely varied political backgrounds and leanings, passed each of these by pretty significant margins. Yeah, I think a couple things. One, if you look at the states that were targeted, it was really smartly done by, uh, by some of the organizations who feel that those uh, ballot questions, they were, you don't see the New England states, you don't see states on the West Coast, or even out West, the closest state was Oregon, where the majority vote was uh, under 60%. I think it was 57 or 58. My sense is when you get to those other states, there's probably a split that ranges somewhere between 60-40 and 55-45. That is remarkable. <coughs> I mean, mar the whole dis debate about marriage is one year old. Um, if you had asked me five years ago, I would have said we never would even have the debate in America for another 25 years. And so I think what is happening is that as people experience this over time and have a discussion about it and understand it, 
their position is changing. And my belief is that within the next five years, you're going to have a strong majority of Americans. When I say strong majority, I think it's going to be about 75 percent that support civil unions or some form of um, marriage or some, some type of civil marriage license that will fit that mold. If it's not five years, it's definitely going to be 10 years. And the reality is this. In Vermont, when, the, when they passed civil unions four years ago, <coughs> um, about 40% of people supported civil unions. They thought it was the far right groups um, had told them it was going to destroy the families in Vermont, marriage was going to be destroyed, children were going to be harmed by all this. Today in Vermont, 80% of people support civil unions and almost 50 support marriage because now they know that the, the, the family that they live with for the last 25 years down the road, the guy who had his friend living with him, one who is a teacher, one who is a veteran, who volunteered at the Chamber of Commerce, who sits two rows behind them at church on the weekend, they happen to have one of those civil unions. So instead of having the lawn sign saying, take back Vermont, which they had four years ago, that couple, that very conservative, very Republican, very value-based religious family at the end of the street, now when asked says, you know, let those guys have it. They're decent people. They help fix our neighborhood. They actually plowed out our driveway when it snowed. Um, and what I think is as, the, as we experience these issues, I'm not sure we'll have a majority in the country who uh, understand or support gay marriage within the next five years. But I do think when we talk about inheritance and social security and visiting partners in a hospital and all of those elements, most Americans are already there. It's about having this discussion in a way that's thoughtful. So I think there's hope, despite the fact that certainly the country is not ready. If you polled the nation right now for gay marriage, it would lose. It may even, quite frankly, not get uh, as much gay and lesbian support, because gay and lesbian Americans are just learning the differences between civil unions and marriage. There are couples in Vermont who believed when they got their civil unions that when their partner of 40 years died, that they'd get their Social Security benefits. Like every other American, they don't. When they have inheritance tax, lo tax laws in the federal government, if your partner of 50 years dies, you get double taxed when your partner dies. So these small things are teaching even gay and lesbian Americans the differences that exist right now in those laws. The government may come up with a different form to define all these relationships in the next 10 years for tax purposes and otherwise. But I think in the short term is we need to talk about those benefits and stop talking about kind of the broader terms, and I think that's a way to have a discussion. And I think ultimately conservatives will figure out a way. And even the president uh, most recently has started indicating some support for civil unions. And that's a pretty big path from where, um, you know, the sense of where he is. But um, we're making, making some progress. What's, what's your take on uh, Bill Clinton's uh, advice to John Kerry during the election to also support a uh, constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage? It's one of those, uh, I guess it backs up my, uh, A, I think Bill Clinton is a smart politician. He's been the most successful Democrat in 20 years, and he knows that this issue was dealt with in a strange way by John Kerry. I, I, I know John Kerry well from Massachusetts. Um, I worked with him uh, when I was uh, mayor of a city. Um, he campaigned against me in most of my races for office um, in Massachusetts, and I campaigned against him on several occasions. Uh, but I think, what, interestingly enough, Bill Clinton basically said, and a lot of people in the Clinton team were saying, you either have to be for something and get credit for it or be against something and not ha have yourself damaged. What John Kerry did, and it's kind of his weakness politically, quite frankly, a gifted man, I thought he ran a fairly decent campaign, is that on too many issues, including this particular issue, he tried to speak on both sides of the issue. He was against a federal constitutional amendment, but he was for a Massachusetts constitutional amendment. He doesn't support gay marriage, but he supports all the benefits of marriage as long as it's called something else. And what he ended up doing is having a less than enthusiastic amount of support from progressives and ticking everyone else on the right and giving Karl Rove the perfect opportunity to say, this guy's for these things. Clinton was basically saying, I think the polling right now shows this isn't going to help you, so just say it. <laughs> um, quite frankly, we all know now that Rove's advice, whether we liked it or not, you know, helped in a few swing states. I don't think it was, I don't believe um, that it was the determining factor in this election. I think the war on terrorism was, and I think Senator Kerry's votes 
confusing votes about supporting the war and then making another decision on troops was the fundamental issue that shifted the election and that I don't think John Kerry could get out of that box. And, um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad he didn't take Bill Clinton's advice and support a constitutional amendment. I think that would have been dangerous. I'm, I'm proud, actually, in the United States Senate um, that it was really Republicans who helped shift the debate over the federal marriage amendment last year. Most of my year last year was spent meeting privately with United States senators and staff and building Republican opposition to a federal constitutional amendment. Um, and uh, I had some amazing meetings with conservatives walking through these issues. And when John McCain went to the floor of the United States Senate and said, this constitutional amendment is antithetical to people who love the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, um, that it's something that we should not support. When Senator John Warner, a good close ally of the president, head of armed services, went on the floor and said, I've read this amendment, I've read its second sentence, and this suggests to me that the people who designed this amendment we're looking at more than just protecting marriage. When John Sununu from New Hampshire, who had never had a record of supporting um, these type of issues, voted against it and a series of other Republicans, it was a statement that if we can talk to conservatives about this stuff, even they at a certain point will ultimately be on our side. And uh, one closing note for your question, um, a little bit disconnected, was that uh, Log Cabin had an open house last week in Washington and the guest at our office was Senator Gordon Smith a Mormon from Oregon, conservative, very family-based religious man. And he, wa he came into the office, and his statement was very clear. He said, this has been a really tough year for those of us who are trying to figure this issue out. We've had disagreements about gay marriage, he said, but we need somebody and some organization to talk to us. We want to listen. We want to learn. We want to figure this out. I think we can make some progress among conservatives. Can you help us do that? And for those of you who probably saw the flyer or heard that I was coming, probably said, does this group really exist or how nuts are these people? I hope that you know, if you walk away from anything from here, even if you totally disagree with everything I've said, it's trying to understand that why it's really important that somebody talks to conservatives in America about these issues. If we don't do that, we'll just be walking in two different directions. And we're hoping we can play a small part in helping out other progressive groups who've, who've carried a lot of the weight for the last several decades. My question actually stems right off of what you've just said. Um, the difficulty that I think a lot of um, more progressive and, and, and left-leaning uh, gay Americans have is that they really feel like, at least on a leadership level, the, the Republican Party simply doesn't want them. It will take their vote but it won't take their soul, it won't take their heart and say, we're going to make this, we're going to make this our fight because we believe in you. Right. And I'm wondering how you feel in the trenches, can, is, the, is there a place, truly a place, for gay Americans to be in the Republican Party? And if so, how is that going to happen? Yeah. Is all we hear in the news is simply that we're not wanted? Right. I think the, the, the baseline is the news likes the black and white of this. It's an easy clip. You've got to get in three minutes. You know, it's us against them. Uh, what they don't like is there, there's a lot of gray in Washington. And I would say this, Republicans have not done the kind of overt outreach from the leadership of the party that it ought to if it ever expects to build greater Republican support. I would say on the other end that Democrats have been good at collecting gay money and making promises during elections and not delivering. And it's, uh, you know, if in the United States Senate, there are, there are I'm aware of one person who supports gay marriage, and it's Lincoln Chafee, Republican of Rhode Island. Uh, I know who the lead co-sponsors of the Employment Non-Discrimination Act are. Arlen Specter, Republican of Pennsylvania, Hillary Clinton of New York. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's an interesting mix. When you go down the line and ask who the co-sponsors are and who's pushing it, Democrats certainly outweigh Republicans, but there are Republicans one by one now who are moving on to these pieces of legislation. And what you're going to see is as you saw in a hate crimes vote that occurred at the end of the United States Senate session last year, um, 18 Republicans voted for hate crimes. Only three voted for hate crimes when it was voted on last time. And so you're watching this slow progress of adding Republicans on to Democrats. Um, but I think there's definitely room in the party. When you go to pockets of the country, whether it's, I know it's hard to believe, the Terminator running California, when you look at New England where um, you know, we have, we have a domestic partnership in Massachusetts because of a Republican governor. 
In California, it was Mayor Reardon, a Republican, that brought domestic partnership there. It was Chrissy Todd Whitman, who just came out with a book and is helping lead a new um, organization. She announced it uh, yesterday for fiscal conservatives and social <laughs> moderates, um, who appointed the first uh, open lesbian, I believe, to the courts of uh, New Jersey. You can go right down the line, and there have been pockets where Republicans have shown leadership. Unfortunately, uh, when you look at the leadership of the party right now, it hasn't done the things that indicate it's welcoming. My belief is this. You Democrats were successful in changing the Democratic Party by talking to people, making political contributions, campaigning for them, and standing by them when they weren't perfect for 20 years. And there were Democrats who were awful on these issues 20 years ago. They were better because of loyalty and because of friendships and because of campaign contributions. And I know it's messy sometimes, but I think Republican, gay and lesbian Americans who happen to be conservative on all these other issues ought to do the same exact thing. And they should show integrity as well. If someone really speaks out in a way that's intolerant, they need to call them on it as well. So it's a, it's a tough path. I think we're getting there. The, the exit polls show about 25% of uh, gay and lesbian Americans vote Republican in almost any election, including this last one. So it's a, you know, there is a voting block that exists and is real. We have time for about one more question, and our room reservation runs out. Yeah, and I'll stick around to chat on the way up. Sir. Um, let's see if I can gather my thoughts and word this right. Um, as an, a Mormon, you talked about Senator Smith, I think, in, in Oregon. We represent probably the only other group that has ever been, I don't know, litigated against or, or, or judicially punished for sexual practices with polygamy, <laughs> um, oddly enough, and that we have in common. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, the, um, as a member of the church, which recently within the last month has issued a, a, proclama a proclamation um, basically saying we, we love the people but we don't support the, the act, um, there, there's, there's a problem there. My question is, I sat there when we watched CNN when Gavin Newsom was, was speaking with, I think, a representative from Colorado. Yeah. And the representative kept hitting the, the polygamy and the bestiality theme. And <laughs> Gavin Newsom was very well spoken the entire time. But I couldn't help but think that every time that came up, it was just kind of evasive. And th the reasoning just wasn't there. Whereas sure. everything else, I really felt like you know he was grounded. He thought about it. And I could you know kind of understand at least where it was coming from. My question is, in the, over the course of the last hour, you, you've, you've said a lot of things. You've been very well spoken. You made a little comment about um, Santorum dwelling on polygamy. You um, wondered about um, Mr. Knight being the conservative women's representative as a man, um, which also elicited laughter. And then you talked about Republicans bashing. Um, my question is, first, how do you reconcile th this open-mindedness that we're supposed to have, everyone, this target audience, with little comments like that that are just representative of the same behavior but towards other groups? And then second, what do I say to my 20-month-old my son when 20 years from now there's another well-dressed, well-spoken, uh, seemingly very kind and good man who, who says we were looking for stable relationships for our polygamists? And I think what a little joke about the bestiality people. Right. Well, I, I think to, to have a, a bit of a sense of humor here, uh, one of the things you'll find wherever I travel in the country is I have very civil discussions with people who say horrific things about me and whether I'm an American and how they identify me. Um, I can be, uh, be uh, light and humorous at times. Uh, the fact, I, I was more laughing about the fact that the word concerned woman of America, the fact that Robert Knight, and I've said this to him to his face, so I'm not speaking behind his back, wakes up each day obsessed with gay sex is weird to me. Um, he begins every discussion we have with a description of what gay, go, gay folks do. Um, if I had as much sex as he talks about, I'd be the happiest guy in America. <laughs> and so I've said this to him to his face. I don't mean it to be disrespectful. He seems to be obsessed with gay sex. Um, I also think it's important to say that there are folks in America who wake up each day and when they're on TV choose to articulate a denial of basic civil rights to part of the American family. I don't do that. I haven't done that from this podium. I wouldn't want to deny 
anyone from anyone on the political spectrum the freedom and liberty to do anything. I can, give them a, I can have great debates against them. I can question their values as a part of it, but I don't disrespect them. Um, at moments, if I didn't find humor in it, um, it would be difficult to go on to the next city. I guess the best way to respond to the issue of polygamy is to, is to note two things before I close. The first is, and a number of you are law students, uh, I think it's the, if you haven't read the Goodrich decision from Massachusetts, um, read it. it. It is not a long document. It is fundamentally conservative. It makes it very, very clear what they're talking about, and it makes it very, very clear that they're talking about every person having the right to have one lifetime partner. Issues of polygamy that involve multiple people and potentially the exposure of children to a series of different parents and all the legal and other complications do not apply to two individuals in a civil contract together. And the Massachusetts court was very concerned about the issues of polygamy and other issues that could apply. I have not heard folks make those arguments. I don't believe the arguments for marriage equality or civil unions would apply to polygamy. And the best example, and I've said this to Senator Santorum staff when I've had some disagreements with them, is that about 20-something years ago, Pennsylvania was one of the first states to overturn their sodomy laws. And I have not seen a spike in polygamy in Pennsylvania over the last quarter century. And so I think uh, you've got the experience of different states who found the sodomy laws to be offensive. We did not see spikes in polygamy. Uh, we can study that over the next 50 years. I doubt it's going to be the case. And third, the, the smart and conservative legal arguments being used around the country would clearly not apply to polygamous relationships, which have a series of other liabilities socially and for children and for relationships that wouldn't apply to having the, the freedom to find a, a life partner. Um, let me note this, though, because I think you have a concern. And I bet it's a legitimate one. The notion of opening up a, a beautiful and traditional institution of marriage is a significant debate. And it, I have cautioned um, more left-leaning activists to, to step back and breathe and give the American people a right to discuss this. This is not a small thing to do. And to do it well means to talk about it, to be concerned about what risks there might be or what legal implications this could have for polygamy and other things. And so I think your point is well taken that this is not just simple stuff that can be laughed off. It's got to be taken uh, quite seriously. And we ought not to have a national marriage uh, equality uh, vote within one year of this new discussion for America. We ought to give our time. Uh, give our nation a chance to do it well, and I'm hoping to be a conservative voice in helping it navigate it, navigate it through it thought, thoughtfully. Thanks for your time today. <laughs>